Hello and welcome to Historia Ecclesiastica. In this ninth part of the Apostle series, we will examine the life and ministry and apostolic traditions of St. Thomas the Great Missionary. We will also examine the 23 rites of the Catholic Church, and we'll talk about the history of those rites with their apostolic foundations, and also how each of the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church re-entered communion with Rome. Let's pray a prayer from the Feast of St. Thomas the Apostle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Grant, Almighty God, that we may glory in the Feast of the Blessed Apostle Thomas, so that we may always be sustained by his intercession, and believing may have life in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, whom St. Thomas acknowledged as the Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and I greatly appreciate reading your comments below. You guys are some very intelligent YouTubers, and I always like reading what you have to say in the discussions below. In this video, once again, we will talk about the different rites of the Catholic Church and talk about their formation and their unique features. We'll also be able to tell the entire story of St. Thomas the Apostle. And if you would like to have access to these slideshows, just become a basic level member or higher, and uh, you can reach out to me via email, and I will send you any slideshows you would like to have. There are some videos in these slideshows that I can't play for copyright reasons, but if you are interested in, in presenting um, these slideshows to a class of your own, then you may find that useful. Before we talk about St. Thomas, let's just review the uh, kind of the center of our faith. And that is centered around the fact that on Easter Sunday, the world changed forever. Our Lord, who was dead, lying in the tomb, rose. And he broke through the floodgates of death by his divine power, destroying death once and for all. His risen flesh was the first seed of the new creation. In the body of Jesus, the new universe, the new heavens and earth have already begun. In these new heavens and earth, heaven and earth are unified. And one day, all of heaven and all of earth will be unified. But that has already begun in the body of Christ. We achieve membership with the body of Christ, and we achieve citizenship in the new heavens and earth by being members of Jesus through holy baptism and through an act of participation in the Holy Catholic Church. This is the most glorious day in world history, and every other glory that has happened since then is only glorious because of its association with the risen body of Jesus. And if our lives are going to be glorious, they must be joined to the risen body of Jesus. If we should remain cut off from him by our actions, by our beliefs, that is the greatest tragedy uh, possible. So the apostles rejoiced when they saw the risen Jesus and they began to participate in this mystery and they began to see the new heavens and the new earth made present before them in the glory of the risen body of the Lord. But one of them doubted. And so this is the beginning of what most people know about St. Thomas. Unfortunately, it's the end of what most people know about St. Thomas as well. He's called Doubting Thomas and that's kind of like, okay, well that's his title. And that's all a lot of people know about him. We'll see in this video that, yes, he did doubt. And um, that was uh, regrettable. But I think it's even more amazing than it is regrettable to look at all the amazing things that St. Thomas did after he found the risen Lord. So let's talk about the story of St. Thomas the Apostle. Let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 20. If you want to read the same translation as I am, I will be reading from the Douay Rems translation. We begin reading from John chapter 26. And we read, this is eight, day, eight days after Easter Sunday. So it reads, And after eight days, his disciples were again within, and Thomas with them. Jesus cometh, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be to you. Then he saith to Thomas, Put in thy finger hither, and see my hands, and bring hither thy hand, and put it into my side. And be not incredulous, but faithful. Let's pause. Quick note. Um, this happens eight days after Easter Sunday. This is the octave day of Easter. Easter is such a glorious solemnity, as many of you know. 
it consumes eight days of the calendar. So the uh, Easter and the following seven days are all considered Easter. It's an eight-day feast liturgically. And St. Thomas was not there the first day. St. Thomas was there on the octave day. This is the reason this gospel is read on the Feast of Divine uh, Mercy Sunday, the eighth day after Easter, because, of course, this is what happened eight days after Easter. And our Lord refer uh, referenced to St. Thomas his exact words he had used. He said, I will not believe that Jesus has risen unless I put my finger in his side and in the holes in his hands. And um, so St. Thomas basically said, I need absolute proof, even though all 11 of the, or all 10 of the other apostles said they had seen him as well as the woman he would not believe unless he had absolute proof jesus comes to him and uses the exact same words that saint thomas had used and this is a sign of jesus's omniscience he's all-knowing and his omnipresence and this convinces thomas completely um, of course the beautiful artwork you see here shows saint thomas actually you know taking the lord up on his offer and in fact putting his finger in his side and um so it's a beautiful, people love this image because a lot of people in our world today have a lot of doubt and have a hard time believing in um, the awesomeness of uh, the Catholic faith. And uh, people want more proof, more proof, more proof. And so a lot of people can relate to St. Thomas. It is, of course, worth noting that St. Thomas, did. it doesn't say that he actually did need, you know, to absolutely stick his finger in there, um, though he may have. All that we read is that after Jesus says, Be not incredulous, but faithful. In verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And it's so worth noting that St. Thomas is the very first of the apostles to explicitly use the words, My God, when referring to Jesus. Okay, so the idea, of course, that the um, early church corrupted the early tradition and they divinized Jesus, turned him from a man into a god, is, is um, nonsense. It's right here in the Gospel of John, which is written at the end of the Apostle John's life, but he was one of the apostles. It was written in the 90s AD, and he is, of course, a faithful witness. He did not fabricate things. So anyways, St. Thomas did, in fact, refer to Jesus as God. And so he is able to go from being the one who expressed the greatest doubt to, in a way, expressing the greatest faith, uh, the first to be open about simply calling Jesus God. Verse 29, Jesus saith to him, Because thou hast seen me, Thomas, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. So that is the gospel, showing St. Thomas is ignited with faith after seeing Jesus. Yeah, it would have been ideal if he didn't need to see Jesus, if he would have just had faith from the word of the other apostles, but... In a way, he wanted it to be true so much, he um, had a hard time, you know, letting it be true. Yeah, he had a hard time believing in it because he just didn't want to be let down again after the crushing sadness he had experienced on Good Friday and Holy Saturday. Um, perhaps a, a small analogy, you know, if you're people that are sports fans, their team could be really, really good, but maybe I'm a Lions fan, you know, so they're really good this year, 2024, but... A lot of us Lions fans have a hard time believing they'll actually be good in the playoffs. You know, we're just kind of waiting for the shoe to drop because we don't want to be crushed again. It's a very small analogy, but I think that's something of what St. Thomas was experiencing on Easter Sunday. He really wanted Jesus to have risen, um, but he didn't want to let himself have faith. He didn't want to be crushed. But Jesus still reproves him for it. He still should have had faith. And Jesus extends a blessing out to all of us Christians who have not seen Jesus, at least Externally, We've seen him mysteriously in the Holy Sacrament because he's with us always till the end of the age. But he extends a blessing to those who believe without having seen him. As we said, many people today are much like doubting Thomas. And hopefully, by the grace of Jesus, he, um, he can appear to them in a way that is um, able to reach their hearts. And they can then become great missionaries like St. Thomas was. Just a little note on this whole um, idea that a lot of doubting Thomases have in the modern world today about, I will not believe until there is substantial proof. That's the big thing that most sophomoric atheists will say is, well, there's just not sufficient scientific evidence for God, therefore why would I believe in him? And on the one hand, one cannot scientifically 
you would think at least one cannot scientifically absolutely prove there is a god or there isn't he's not observable by the five senses and so science does not have any ability to verify things that are not observable by the five senses because that's what the scientific method has the ability to um, analyze however there is scientific evidence for the existence of god um, the shroud of turin is one of the most profound examples of that and there are all kinds of miracles medically proven miracles for um since the congregation for the canonization of saints was created in the 18th century it's been required that a number of medically verified miracles are performed after the death of an individual in order for them to be canonized as a saint and on the at least today with the way that this congregation operates for a miracle to be medically confirmed there has to be a team of doctors that analyze uh, an alleged miracle and they all have to be in agreement that there is no medical explanation whatsoever in other words there's no scientific explanation no physical explanation for a healing and on those team of doctors it is required that a number of them be not catholic so that there's no bias at all um, caused by a devotion to a particular um, servant of God or uh, venerable. So there are medically confirmed miracles where it can be said with certainty there's no scientific explanation for a healing. And we can also say with certainty that the healing came immediately after an individual prayed to a saint for their intercession. Is that scientific evidence for God? It, it seems like it. I mean, it's more reasonable to say, well, they prayed. And then something absolutely scientifically inexplicable happened um, miraculously. It's more reasonable to say their prayer was answered by the deity through the intercession of saints than it would be to say, oh, well, there's just some other scientific thing we don't understand yet. The Shroud of Turn is another example of scientific evidence for God. So no, today's Doubting Thomases likely won't get the opportunity to put their finger in Jesus' side. But if they're looking for absolute proof, hopefully they look into the Shroud of Turin. These are just a few of the notes about the Shroud of Turin. It does have confirmed AB bloodstains. And this blood tape is consistent with the blood which has been found in all Eucharistic miracles which were submitted for blood testing. Indicating AB blood is the blood type of Jesus. And that is the blood type of the universal receiver which is interesting because our Lord receives each of us into his body. Mystically, that is. Anatomical analysis reveals that the Shroud of Turin has a photographic negative of a man who was in fact crucified and scourged. If it was a medieval uh, forgery, crucifixion and scourging were not typical um, forms of capital punishment whatsoever in medieval Europe. It would be considered extraordinarily blasphemous to perform a crucifixion in medieval Europe. As I mentioned, the image on the Shroud of Turin, and this is enhanced in this picture here, you can look up an actual image if you'd like, it is a photographic negative. Think about how complicated that would be to forge in the medieval um, era with the technology they had. A 1978 study revealed that it was not made from dyes, chemicals, vapors, scorching, or brush strokes. It is in fact a photographic negative created through radiation. John Jackson's hypothesis in 2008 argued convincingly that the image was made from vacuum ultraviolet radiation, which of course no medieval artist had any access to. The ENEA in Italy found that between 4 and 8 billion watts of energy were needed to create this photographic negative. Others suggest up to 34 trillion watts may have been needed. But this blast of light requiring this tremendous amount of radiation would have needed to have lasted only for a tiny microsecond, otherwise it would have completely vaporized the shroud. So there's an explosion of light happening, creating this image, creating a photographic negative of a man who has been crucified and scourged. It would have had to have required a tremendous amount of energy, which of course no medieval artist had access to, and it would have needed to have lasted only a tiny fraction of a second, and that is a beautiful... Um, image of how the resurrection very likely could have looked the beginning of the entire new universe the old universe began with an explosion of light according to the big bang theory 
And according to the ENAAs and other um, researchers' theory about how the Shroud of Turin was formed, it was an explosion of light as well. And once again, um, the resurrection of Jesus was the beginning of the new universe. The only bit of evidence which indicates the Shroud of Turin is a forgery is the carbon dating. This dated the Shroud to the Middle Ages. However, it was likely taken from a sample of a portion of the Shroud which had been patched. And in just the last year, more recent dating examined the degeneration of the linen fibers of the Shroud in comparison to the aging of a flax fiber cloth. And this more precise method of dating because carbon dating is not very accurate when dealing with things that are less than 2,000 years old. Carbon dating is more accurate when giving you a rough ballpark for how old a fossil is that's several million of years old. This Shroud of Turin, at the oldest, is 2,000 years old. So there's not very much um, precise dating in, in the carbon dating for something that young. You know, the carbon dating could easily be off by 500 years because it's just not that... It's not a very good method for dating something like this. That's this young. So looking at the um, degeneration of the linen fibers is a more accurate method of um, dating this material. And that method of dating, which just was concluded in a study in the last year, dated the shroud to the early first century. Try to convince me this is not the burial cloth of Jesus. If you are simply looking at the scientific evidence... It would be absurd to say this is not the burial shroud of a man who was crucified and rose from the dead. That's simply what the science is indicating. As we mentioned, St. Thomas the Apostle was the first to say, My Lord and my God. He remained with the Apostles praying for the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, led by St. Peter. He received the Holy Spirit upon his head, in the form of a tongue of fire, he received the gift of tongues, and he was equipped to go forth and spread the gospel on Pentecost Sunday, 33 AD, in Jerusalem. No doubt he would have been in the river helping to baptize the 3,000 3, neophytes on Pentecost Sunday. What a glorious day this was. The church was hiding in an upper room that morning and that evening. They had grown by 3,000 thanks to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has the ability to change hearts and convert souls today. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we pray for the Holy Spirit, we're not only praying that we'll have the words to say to reach people, but also that the Holy Spirit will reach them himself in their hearts. Both are necessary for conversions. St. Thomas served, of course, alongside the other apostles around the city of Jerusalem until about the year 50 AD when they dispersed. And... If the apostles had planned out ahead of time where each would go, perhaps Jesus helped them come up with this plan before he ascended into heaven. Then St. Thomas would know throughout his time serving in Jerusalem that he was one day going to be assigned to one of the farthest missions in the world, to one of the most foreign cultures from the Jewish culture and the Roman world, um, the, the Greco-Roman culture. While once the greatest doubter, St. Thomas would travel lengths with which no other apostle would in order to bring the light of Christ to all the people he possibly could. In order to look at some of his traditions, we are going to look at the Acts of Thomas. It should be noted that the Acts of Thomas is a Gnostic sect. I wouldn't even necessarily recommend reading it. It's very saturated with Gnostic um, ideas and kind of like the weird incantations of Gnosticism that were supposedly going to free a soul from the world of matter. It's basically witchcraft um, mixed with a dualistic and uh, anti-material religion. And I have a video on the second century heresies if you want to learn more about Gnosticism. The reason we're still going to look at the Acts of Thomas is that, in general, Gnosticism was sort of like a parasitic infection of the authentic oral tradition. There are a number of Gnostic acts of various apostles where the Gnostics were trying to legitimize their strange mystery religion by kind of adhering it to Christianity. And so it's very likely that Gnosticism took authentic oral traditions about what St. Thomas did. And then while telling those stories that were authentic, they inserted Gnostic doctrines and they put them in the lips of St. Thomas. 
The reason we're still examining this document is that the basic outlines of where St. Thomas went and perhaps who the names were of the various um, princes and monarchs that he met and converted, those could be authentic. I'm not saying with certainty that they are, but they could be authentic because once again, the Gnostics, in order to legitimize their texts, would have likely taken actual traditions and then just, like I said, kind of spliced in their own false doctrines and put them into the lips of St. Thomas. So I think that the broad outlines of the Acts of Thomas may be accurate about where St. Thomas went, but we're not going to um, give any legitimacy to the teachings that St. Thomas taught in the Gnostic Acts of St. Thomas. And for what it's worth, the Acts of Thomas does begin by saying that the apostles kind of prearranged who would go where, and that's a common tradition as well in the authentic Catholic tradition. It says in uh, Thomas 1, 1, We divided the regions of the world, that every one of us should go unto the region that fell to him, and unto the nation whereunto the Lord sent him. This articulates the idea that Jesus would have helped parcel out the different nations of the world that were known to the apostles and sent them forth to those various nations. This comes from the Acts of Thomas as well. That St. Thomas said, I am a Hebrew, so St. Thomas speaking to Jesus is, is allegedly kind of um, arguing, saying he didn't necessarily want to go to the Indians. I am a Hebrew man. How can I go amongst the Indians and preach the truth? And as he thus reasoned and spake, the Savior appeared unto him by night, and saith to him, Fear not, Thomas, go thou on to India, and preach the word there, for my grace is with thee. On his way to India, though, St. Thomas had to pass through the, um, the, the realm of the kingdom of Edessa, and the Edessans were kind of in the northern part of what was once Babylonian or Chaldean civilization. It still was Chaldean civilization. So St. Thomas would have preached amongst the Chaldeans in the cities on his journey when he passed through what is modern-day Iraq. He may have even met King Agbar, which we talked about in the very first video I posted on YouTube. Um, king Agbar was the king of Edessa, who, according to an early tradition, which is probably spurious, wrote a letter to Jesus while he still lived, offering him his military protection when he heard that people sought out his life. According to the tradition, Jesus wrote Akbar a letter back saying, um, no, no, this is kind of part of the plan, but um, I, I'm going to stay here in Israel and Judah, but once I die, um, I will send one of my apostles to you. According to that tradition, once again, St. Jude was, sat to, was sent to King Akbar and converted him and the people of Edessa. And that is why St. Jude is one of the founders of the Chaldean Rite. St. Thomas is as well, though, and it's, poss it's possible that St. Thomas did even more good amongst the Chaldeans. Um, and so I said he might have met King Akbar, but he certainly preached amongst the uh, Chaldeans of what is today Iraq. Okay, so once again, he came from Jerusalem, likely traveled north to Antioch. That's kind of the crossroads of the ancient world. And then he would have traveled to the east, uh, passing through Edessa. It would have been a logical um, city for him to pass through on his way to India, where he was destined to go. But once again, he established many churches in uh, amongst the Chaldeans, forming the Chaldean Catholic Church, which in ancient times was called the East Syrian Church. The following Catholic and um, Apostolic Orthodox churches, or even uh, deformed, you know, Protestant bodies, consider St. Thomas their founder. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see. The ancient church of the East is um, kind of the orthodox name for the Chaldean Catholic Church. You can pause and read all these if you want, but um, the, the wide variety of churches in uh, the Iraq region and also India bear testimony to the very strong apostolic tradition that St. Thomas was the founder of Christianity in India. Once in India, St. Thomas was able to earn the audience of a great number of Indian kings, and he did have success in converting some of them. Once again, I can't play the video for copyright purposes. If you become a member, you can request any slideshows you'd like, and I'll send them over to you. One tradition even holds that St. Thomas preached in Paraguay, which is remarkable. Paraguay is here in South America, um, so even past the Andes Mountains. Um, 
it's quite a tradition. Um, the reason that it emerged was that when there were missionaries evangelizing in Paraguay, somehow the story got out that they came to a people which were already Christian and they even had some Hebrew like scripts written in their caves. Well, archaeologists have found Hebrew scripts written in the caves of uh, this region. So that's that's verified that there there is random Hebrew writing in the various um, caves of India. And um, anyways, according to that ancient, you know, not ancient, but according to that kind of 16th century tradition, people in Paraguay had already been evangelized by St. Thomas and had been holding on to the faith ever since. I'm sure Mormons would like to latch on to the Hebrew and the caves thing because they believe that Jesus came and evangelized in um, the Americas. But according to the Mormon tradition, um, the Book of Mormon was not written down in Hebrew. It was written down in the native um, script of the people that originally inhabited the Americas. That's all fictitious, of course, but that's why would they have Hebrew written in caves if the Book of Mormon was not written in uh, Hebrew? And also, um, the Mormon tradition doesn't hold that Jesus did anything down in Paraguay. Anyways, this is more examples of uh, script. So you could, yeah, you could look into all that if you want. It's kind of an interesting topic. Um, I definitely take it with a big grain of salt, though. Saint Thomas would have certainly taught the form of Mass and the other sacraments that he had celebrated in Jerusalem with the other 12 apostles in any churches that he started, whether those churches were in um, the Edessan kingdom of East Syria, amongst the Chaldeans, amongst the princes of India, or even perhaps amongst the Paraguayans. St. Thomas would have transmitted a liturgy similar to the one he practiced in Jerusalem. Yet, since a wide variety of cultures celebrated the Mass thanks to him, like the culture of the Chaldeans, the people of India, potentially the Paraguayans, or even the Chinese. It's likely that he did help guide these people to adapt the liturgy to meet some of the needs of their particular culture. Because being one church, being one unified church under God, and being one unified church led by the Pope, does not mean that there needs to be only one set of rituals that we all have to follow. There is flexibility in the church's worship to adapt certain rituals to the religious genius of particular churches. And this leads us into a discussion of the various rites of the Catholic Church. So in the Catholic Church today, there are a great number of rites, and uh, we're going to talk about each of the different rites of the Catholic Church, how they formed, and we'll talk about a few of the unique characteristics of the different rites. So what exactly is a rite? A rite is a set of rituals. That's where the uh, root R-I-T comes from. So this is a great graphic from the Baltimore Catechism. You can see the Roman Church has primacy amongst the church simply because the leader of the Roman Church is the Pope. The Pope is the foundation of the church. And so there is a hierarchy here. As you can see here, this ladder does not have any particular order. It's just trying to show that the Pope's kind of on top, but it's not like the various churches are actually ranked in this manner. But all of the most antique and important churches of the world are in communion with the Church of Rome um, and the Pope. So this is just showing a variety of different churches that are all in communion with the Pope. And once again, they're not listed in any order. Um, around the world, we can say that God we can say that God has inspired his one Catholic church to develop various rites to celebrate the diversity of the human people, which God enjoys various different cultures when they are all within the boundaries of sound truth and morality. We could say that diversity is enjoyed by God, and we could say that that diversity is enjoyed by God in the various ritual traditions of the church because each one can emphasize something different but authentic about the one true faith. So, it's important though to know that the various rites of the church, the distinctions between the rites, are not there to celebrate the differences between people. They're all there to celebrate the glory of God. But 
different people and different cultures have different strengths and weaknesses, perhaps, more, more so strengths, let's say, in worshiping God. And so it's fitting that different cultures are permitted to worship God in unique ways within the boundaries of morality and truth in order to give God more glory in a particular area. Okay, so each rite has a certain strength that they offer to the uh, worship of God. A rite is a liturgical and canonical tradition. Liturgical means the manner in which each different rite prays is slightly unique. And then canonical means the manner in which that rite governs itself is somewhat unique. There are different particular rules about um, the requirements, let's say, for how a priest is trained or the requirements that a priest has to fulfill. There's different, um, there, so there's different rules or governing policies within the rites. But um, there's also different liturgies or manners of praying, the divine office, and the sacraments, all within the boundaries of authentic tradition and truth. Each rite, as I just mentioned, has a different liturgy of the hours. Most rites call their liturgy of the hours an office because the word office, officium, is Greek for work. So the divine office is the divine work of the church in offering up the 150 psalms to God regularly. Most offices pray all 150 psalms per week. That's kind of the ideal, um, but not all do. The um, modern liturgy of the hours in the Roman Rite, um, it, it doesn't pray the imprecatory psalms on a uh, regular basis. Those are not included in the liturgy of the hours. Certain psalms are missing verses as well because they're deemed to be imprecatory. And also the liturgy of the hours prays the uh, 100 well, it prays the Psalter, not the complete Psalter, on a four-week cycle rather than a one-week cycle. Most Greek, most Eastern Orthodox offices are going to pray all 150 psalms on a weekly cycle, so it's quite a bit more prayer. Um, it does allow the Liturgy of the Hours to be a little bit more accessible to lay people, which is, I guess, an advantage that lay people can participate in this more easily. It's only five prayers a day, and um, each one takes about 10 minutes, so it's, it's quite doable. Each church also, as I said, has their own set of canons. The word canon means rules or canon laws. Is it good that there are so many different rites in the Catholic Church? Would it not be better if all of the different people of the world worshipped in the same exact way with the same liturgy? Well, God does love unity. Certainly, God also does love diversity when it is authentic diversity. And I'm just going to write a note about that because diversity is... Um, turned into an idol in the West quite oftenly, so we're going to talk about the actual merit of diversity for a moment. In modern Western societies, unfortunately, many regard diversity, such as having a diverse friend group, having diverse employees, diverse characters in a cast, or even having diverse college students in a college promotional. Uh, many regard this to be a sort of moral virtue. Is diversity in itself a virtue? When well-ordered, diversity can be advantageous in the manner in which having a diverse assortment of people with different backgrounds and cultures can offer fresh perspectives on a topic which emphasizes a true element. I work with a diverse group of students. I've learned a lot from their cultures. I have a diverse group of friends, thankfully. Um, I just live in Metro Detroit. It's an extremely diverse area, so I have a lot of friends that are, are different um, cultures and whatnot, and uh, you know, you can learn a lot from someone of a different culture. They offer a fresh perspective. Um, I don't think pe people sometimes have an attitude where it's like, well, the other culture is always right, my culture is always wrong. That's that's not intelligent, you know. Of course, um, truth is found where truth is. You shouldn't always be like eating dirt about your own culture like a lot of um, Western people are, but regardless, you can learn a lot from people of a different perspective. But diversity can become disordered when it becomes an end in itself. Pursuing diversity can sometimes supersede the desire for truth. In the church's liturgical rites, it is assumed that all rites are entirely orthodox. And therefore, the diverse manners in which these rites worship God and govern themselves can offer a unique perspective and emphasis on the one internal truth and the one internal faith. So as long as all the different rites are remaining within the boundaries and the guiding light of orthodoxy, which is the authentic faith of the apostles, um, then, then great. You know, they can all offer a fresh perspective. 
But if we begin to make diversity an end in itself, and let's say there was a, there was a failed attempt in the 1970s to create a so-called Hindu rite, where there was going to be an elements of Hinduism incorporated into um, the Catholic worship in India, that's really bad, right? So that's making diversity an end in itself instead of making truth and the, the one true faith the end. So that right would have been a disgrace, and that's why, thankfully, God did not permit that right to form. Is unity a virtue? So if diversity is not a virtue, but is advantageous when well-ordered, what about unity? Is that a virtue? Is it always good to pursue unity? Well, we read in Psalm 132, verse 1, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. Unity is an effect of charity, though. When one loves the other, they seek not only their good, but union with them. So if we are, in fact, being charitable and loving, we will desire unity with others. But unity can become disordered. If unity is prioritized over truth, if one insists on unity in the event in which there must be division in order to distinguish between truth and falsehood, in this case, unity is not meritorious. In 1 Corinthians 11.19, we read, For there must be divisions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. While we can and should have charity for all, we cannot avoid dealing with severe moral or doctrinal errors in order to pursue unity. So if there is a bishop that is teaching something that is legitimately heretical and has been condemned by the church or that goes against um, the church's teachings in any way, other bishops cannot ignore those errors for the sake of unity. In that instance, unity has become disordered. Unity is not an end in itself. Charity is the end of all of our moral actions. And in the event that someone is in grave moral or grave doctrinal error, charity demands not unity with that person, um, but actually it demands reproof because you love the soul and you want them to repent. If you desire unity with them in this passing fleeting world, and as a result of desiring that fleeting unity in this world, you refuse to reprove them, you won't be unified with them for eternity. You're allowing their soul to be cast into hell if you're not doing anything to help them when they're in grave error. What we want is unity in heaven, and sometimes unity in heaven requires division while on earth. In Western nations, unity cannot be prioritized over significant and necessary conflicts over the lives of unborn children bringing this up because a lot of the times in um, even a lot, you know, good faithful Christian circles, people say we need to pray for unity in our country despite political differences. We need to pray for eternal unity with our political opponents. And that will require, in the current state of Western civilization, division while on this earth. If there are people who vehemently, you know, endorse and encourage robbing the unborn children of their right to life, or if there are people that are vehemently advocating for destroying the bodies of gender dysphoric youths, or if there are people that are vehemently advocating to upend the dignity of authentic marriage, we can't have unity with those people where we just gloss over those differences, we have to be willing to say, I can't go there. You're wrong about all these things. And we need to have a peaceful conflict over these things um, because these things are absolutely abhorrent and um, they're putting the souls of anyone who advances those causes or belongs to political movements which advance those causes in grave danger. So we can't just gloss over these objective um, differences in order to to create an artificial unity, which will divide us for all of eternity. And like I said, we cannot avoid tensions over heresies in the church. We must allow there to be divisions amongst us in order that those who are genuine to be recognized. So um, with that said about, um, you know, a little bit about diversity's proper ordering and unity's proper ordering, let's talk about the church's 23 rites, which are well-ordered and are therefore good and should be celebrated because 
they are all within the boundaries and the guiding light of orthodoxy, and each of the rites offers us a fresh perspective about how to worship the one true God. So this table um, shows, I'll try to get rid of my, I can't get rid of my little camera here. Um, if you want to take a screenshot, you could, uh, but I just want to get this out of the way. I can't though. So if you want to take a screenshot though, um, or if you want to, you know, become a member, I'll send this to you. This table shows each of the rites of the Catholic Church, and it shows which apostle these different rites have an association with. I won't say each apostle formed these rites because the liturgical traditions that each of these rites have, um, they all come later than the ministries of the apostles. I believe each of the apostles would have established a more primitive liturgy, um, which you can kind of see outlined in the DDK of the apostles. And then um, in these various regions, um, the cultures and the bishops of these, reg of these regions kind of developed the distinctive liturgies, which we know today. Regardless, each of these rites have their kind of origins with whatever apostle first evangelized to the people there. And it is possible that some of the distinctive elements of these various rites were formed by these apostles. I created a separate chart for the Byzantine rites because the majority of the Eastern Catholic rites are in fact Byzantine or celebrants of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Each one of these rites typically have the name Greek added to their rite, and the first word in each rite is kind of what nationality celebrates this rite. Generally, these rites do celebrate parts of their liturgy in their own native language, but then they're celebrating the official liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which is the liturgy of uh, Constantinople or Byzantium. We can break the rites down into various um, liturgical families, and so we'll, each of the liturgical families will be um, shown with a burgundy background, and then um, we'll have tan for all the particular rites, and um, let's get right to it. So the first liturgical family, and perhaps the most ancient, is the Syriac liturgical family, speaking some form of Syriac language, such as Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, and the, na the language that the people of God spoke ever since their exile amongst uh, the Chaldeans. You know, Aramaic is the language of the Chaldeans still to this day in Iraq, and um, it was the language of Jesus because the Chaldean Babylonians um, put the Israelites into exile and forced them to speak Aramaic while they were there, and that remained the lingua franca of the Jewish people um, to the time of Jesus. So the East Syriac Catholic Church. Um, all Syriac rites refer to the Mass as the Korbana, or Sacrifice. A variety of liturgies are celebrated within this family, um, but notably is the Liturgy of St. James in the Church of Jerusalem, which by tradition was written by St. James himself. It is reasonable to posit that this rite extends out of the earliest liturgical customs of the Apostles in Jerusalem. The Bishop of Antioch is the Patriarch of the Syriac Catholic Church. But in the ancient church, in the, fifth in the 6th century, the Bishop of Antioch rejected the Council of Chalcedon and the teachings about the two natures of Jesus hypostatically unified by his divine person. A new patriarchate was established, however, in the wake of this heretical decision by the Patriarch of Antioch, the new patriarchate did accept Chalcedon. This patriarchate, was, um, this patriarchate which, which was pro-Chalcedon, and celebrated, I'm sorry, um, this patriarchate, which accepted Chalcedon, then established communion with Rome in 1649, and the modern Syriac Orthodox Church was established in order to maintain a state of schism. But the authentic pro-Chalcedon patriarchate actually did convert um, and become Catholic. There was an offshoot of Orthodox that did not want to accept communion with Rome. Even though it was the official patriarchate who accepted the papacy in the 17th century, um, there are only 150,000 Syriac Catholics today, and there are approximately 2 million um, Syrian Orthodox Christians. At the same time, when we say Syrian Orthodox, um, that describes both East Syriac Orthodox and West um, Syriac Orthodox and so um, in the Catholic Church, we have the West Syriac Catholic Church, which we've just been talking about. And then we also have the Chaldean Church is the, the East 
um, Syriac Catholic Church. So the Syrian Orthodox is one body that is, is the same people. So basically there's two Catholic rites, the West Syriac Catholic Church and the Chaldean Catholic Church, and then in the Orthodox side of things, um, they just have the Syrian Orthodox Church. So there's 150,000 Syriac Catholics who are West Syriac Catholics, and then there are 2 million Syrian Orthodox the Syriac Catholic Church is sometimes called the East Syriac Rite, and that would, of course, as I just mentioned, make the Chaldean Church the West Syriac. The I have that backwards. I'm sorry, guys. I've been really messed up here on this slide. So the 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 rite that's centered in Antioch is the the West Syriac Catholic Church. The Chaldean Church would be the East Syriac Catholic Church. All right, the Chaldean Catholic Church, the East Syriac Catholic Church. Chaldean Church prays in Syriac, once again a dialect of Aramaic. Today it is centered in Baghdad, Iraq, although many Chaldeans have migrated to the United States, especially in the Detroit area and San Diego. Um, it is centered in the Cathedral of Our Lady of Sorrows in Baghdad. Ethnically, Chaldeans have ethnic origins with the Chaldeans or Babylonians of the Bible who conquered the chosen people under Nebuchadnezzar and of course stole Job's camels in the book of Job. The Church of the East, as mentioned before, was established by St. Thomas the Apostle and St. Jude. They had a complicated relationship with the papacy, which was weakened further in the ancient church by the Persian Empire severing communication between local bishops and Roman prelates. The Persian Empire had no interest in a religious sect in their empire communicating with Rome, who was a political rival of the time. And this further caused the Chaldeans to enter into schism in uh, the ancient church. In the 5th century, this was made worse by the fact that Chaldean patriarchs accepted the heresy of Nestorianism, which taught that Jesus was both a human and divine person, and Mary was only the mother of the human person, Jesus, not the divine person, the Logos. Throughout its history, rival patriarchs have claimed authority over the Church of the East, so there's been kind of mini-schisms within the Chaldean Church. But these patriarchates uh, varied in uh, which ones were or weren't in relationship, communion with Rome, over the medieval period. There was interest in restoring communion with Rome in the late medieval period. And in the middle of the 19th century, um, the papacy was able to regularize the right to be led by only one patriarch, and uh, finally, the Chaldean Church was firmly in communion with Rome beginning in the 19th century. There are approximately 2 million Chaldeans worldwide, with 500,000 in the United States, as I said, mostly in Detroit and San Diego. I feel privileged to have a pretty um, intimate relationship with the Chaldean community here in Detroit. The school where I teach has about 60% or maybe about half of the student population is Chaldean, so I've I've enjoyed getting to know their culture a bit, and um, I really appreciate the, the deep-seated faith and um, the values of the Chaldean people. Once again, there are approximately 2 million Syrian Orthodox Christians, and once again, the Syrian Orthodox Church is the equivalent to both the Chaldeans and the West Syriac Catholics um, in terms of their liturgy. Now, the Cyril Malabar Rite is the Catholic ancient rite in India. It was established by St. Thomas the Apostle and was later influenced by Chaldean missionaries. For much of its history, the Cyril Malabar Christians looked to the Chaldeans as their patriarchs. But after the Portuguese settled in southwest India in the region of Goa, the Latin bishops claimed leadership of the Cyril Malabar Rite. Tensions existed under this arrangement for centuries and leadership ultimately transferred back to the Chaldean Patriarchate from the Latin bishops in Goa. Eventually, under Pope Leo XIII, the Cyril Malabars were granted liturgical independence. Today, it is led by a major archbishop. Today, there are approximately 4.5 million Cyril Malabar Christians. There are approximately half a million Malankara Orthodox, which is the Orthodox equivalent of this Catholic rite. The Alexandrian Coptic Rite The Alexandrian Rite is the liturgical tradition which emerged from the Church of Alexandria, Egypt, established by St. Mark. Today, the Alexandrian Rite has two branches, the Coptic Catholic Church in Egypt, which uses Coptic, and the Ge'ez Rite, which uses the Ge'ez language, 
which is used in Ethiopian and Eritrean Catholic churches. So it's all one liturgical family with a similar liturgy, but different languages. The Ethiopian and Eritrean churches are two distinctive Catholic churches, which we'll talk about in a moment. Officially, their liturgical books were written in Ge'ez, but they use distinctive vernacular languages in their celebrations as well, since the vernacular is permitted throughout the entire Catholic Church, regardless of rites. The Ethiopians, when they use the vernacular in their liturgy, they celebrate in Amharic, and the Eritreans in their liturgy celebrate in Tekregna. While some cops signed the Cantato Domino at the 15th century Council of Florence, they did not establish lasting communion with Rome, as many Orthodox did not as a result of Florence, even though on paper communion was established. So the Coptic Catholic Rite was established formally and in a lasting manner in 1741 when the Coptic Orthodox Bishop Anba Athanasius converted to Catholicism and was appointed the Apostolic Vicar to the Coptic Catholics. In 1899, the Coptic Catholic population grew to the point in which a patriarchate could be established under Bishop Siri, Cyril Makarios. Today, there are about 210,000 Coptic Catholics worldwide, and there are about 30 million Coptic Orthodox worldwide. The Ethiopian Ge'ez Rite, which we just talked about, this um, rite it has two local churches um, that celebrate it, the Ethiopian and the Eritrean particular churches. In 1839, Catholic missionaries from the Lazarist and Capuchin order had some success in Ethiopia. One of these missionaries, St. Justin de Jacobis, gained permission to celebrate Mass in Ethiopia according to the Alexandrian rite in the Ge'ez language, in order to offer the same liturgy that the Ethiopian Orthodox offered but in a manner which was in communion with Rome. In 1849, he was appointed the apostolic vicar to the Church of Ethiopia, thus establishing an independent particular church of Ethiopia in the Catholic Church. There are about 70,000 Ethiopian Catholic Church members today. Today, in contrast, there are about 36 million Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. In 2015, in response to the 1993 independence of Eritrea, Pope Francis established an independent Eritrean Catholic particular church. Today, its bishop is Archbishop Mangesteb Tesfa Mariam. Tesfa Mariam. There are about 180,000 Eritrean Catholic Christians and approximately 3 million Eritrean Orthodox Christians today. The Armenian Rite The Armenian Catholic Church was established by St. Bartholomew and it is today led by the Armenian Catholic Patriarch of Cilicia, which is a city in Asia Minor, otherwise known as Turkey, today. And so it's interesting that he also, um, the Patriarch of the Armenian Catholic Church, has his Episcopal residence in Beirut, Beirut Lebanon. So it's kind of curious that the um, Armenian Catholic Rite is not centered in Armenia, but in Turkey and Lebanon. And the reason for that is persecution um, during the Armenian genocide of the 20th century. A number of Armenian Catholics were sent into exile. And the Armenian Catholic Patriarchate has been outside of um, Armenia ever since. Now, in the ancient days, the Armenian Catholic, the Armenian Church rejected the Council of Chalcedon. Once again, rejecting that Jesus is only one divine person, stating that he is both a human person and a divine person, making him two persons. But they did make some attempts to re-enter communion with Rome during the Crusades. On paper, the Armenian Church accepted the Council of Florence, but in practice, the clerics, bishops, and people of Armenia remained in schism. Missionaries had some success in converting Armenians to Latin Rite Christianity. One Armenian cleric, Abraham Pierre I Ard Zivian, converted to Catholicism just before being elected to a patriarchal position he would become the head of a newly established Armenian Catholic Church in 1742. Armenian Catholics celebrate the Armenian liturgy in their native tongue. This liturgy was first composed by St. Gregory the Illuminator. There are approximately 130,000 Armenian Catholics and approximately 9 million Armenian Apostolic or Orthodox Christians. The Greek Liturgical Family 
All of the Greek rites developed liturgically within the sphere of influence of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, first established by St. Andrew the Apostle. After the fall of the Western Empire in 476 AD, Constantinople became an extremely important liturgical and intellectual center of Christianity. Its influence during the early Middle Ages is still evidenced by the great number of ethnic churches which celebrate the Byzantine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom to this day. The Albanian Greek Rite Originally, Albanian Christians looked to the Pope as the Patriarch. In the 8th century, Pope Gregory III condemned the Byzantine Emperor Leo III's iconoclasm. As a result, Emperor Leo liturgically annexed the entire province of Illyricum, modern-day Albania, from Rome. And Rome was not powerful enough to really counter this, and so Albania came under the liturgical influence of Constantinople. All the same, the Albanian Latin Rite Catholics persisted in northern Albania, and today most Albanian Catholics are Latin Rite. Beginning in the 17th century, Catholic missionaries had some success converting Orthodox prelates in southern Albania, but the Ottoman rulers actively resisted an establishment of a Catholic Rite. Catholic Byzantine Rite Albanians continued to worship in communion with the Pope, especially in the 20th century, yet they lacked their own Catholic Rite due to political pressure until the fall of the Soviet Union. A rite was established in 1992, but by 2020 it was no longer classified as a local church and was reclassified as an apostolic administratorship. Today, it contains only 3,200 members. In contrast, there are approximately 400,000 Albanian Orthodox Christians, but as we mentioned, most Albanian Christians are Catholic. The Italo albanian Catholic Church is a distinctive particular church. It celebrates the same liturgy of St. John Chrysostom with a combination of Koine Greek and Albanian in their liturgy. These Albanians fled persecution by the Turks in the 15th century and settled in southern Italy and Sicily and in the monastery of Agartaferreta in central Italy. In 1577, Pope Gregory XIII founded a Greek college of St. Athanasius to educate its clerics. These Albanian Christians had already accepted papal supremacy, and they were granted the distinction of being a particular church in the 18th century by Pope Benedict XIV, and they've retained that distinction ever since. Today, there are around, around 80,000 Italo-Albanian Greek Catholics, and of course, they have a very close association with the Albanian Greek Rite. The Belarusian Greek Catholic Church At the 1596 Union of Brest, a number of Byzantine Orthodox Christians residing in the Ruthenian region in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, accepted full communion with Rome, establishing a number of Byzantine Rite Catholic churches. This church, at times, is called the Belarusian Uniite Church, due to the origin this church has in the Union of Brest, as a particular Catholic church, that is. The Greek Belarusian Catholic Church retained its Belarusian identity in a period in which Polonization and Russianization of the area tended to corrode Belarusian identity. Ultimately, once Belarus was absorbed by the Russian Empire, most Belarusians unfortunately became Russian Orthodox due to political pressure. Today, 12,000 Belarusian Catholics are members of this church. In order to show the numbers, 83% of Belarusians today identify as Orthodox, mainly Russian Orthodox, and only about 7% identify as Catholics of any rite. The Ruthenian Greek rite is typically what is meant by Byzantine Catholic. Most people are referring to the Ruthenian Greek Catholics. The term Ruthenia is not a modern-day country. It, in the Medieval Ages, it was a common Latin exonym for the Kievan Rus people, and so it's what people that weren't Russian called the Russians, basically. So Ruthenian, in a way, has an association with Russian Orthodoxy, but it's been very different for a very long time, and so... Not really. Later, the term Ruthenian came to be applied to people from Belarus, Ukraine, and eastern Poland, and some of western Russia in the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania. So it kind of comprises a diverse group of ethnicities. The Ruthenian Catholics accepted the gospel from St. Cyril and Methodius in the late 9th, 9th century and observed the, the liturgical practices of Constantinople ever since. They also followed Constantinople into the Great Schism. At the 1646 Union of Usharod, 63 Ruthenian clergymen, 
and later entire communities of uh, Orthodox were accepted into the Catholic Church. Today, most Ruthenian Catholics are ethnically Rusyn, originating from the Carpathian Mountains of the Ukraine. So there is an association ethnically with the original Russian people there. Today, there are over 400,000 Ruthenian Catholics. In contrast, there are approximately 50,000 Czech or Slovak Orthodox Christians, which is a Orthodox church in approximately the same area. Once again, when people refer to Byzantine Catholics, the most common type of Byzantine Catholic church, especially in the United States, is Ruthenian Catholic. All right, the Bulgarian Greek Rite. The Bulgarian people accepted Christianity in the 9th century. Tsar Boris was planning to accept the liturgy and customs of the Latin Rite originally, but after an invasion by the Byzantine Empire during a time of famine, he was pressured into submitting his nation to the Patriarch of Constantinople. I bring up that point because a lot of people um, tragically convert to Eastern Orthodoxy because they have the impression that it better resembles the church, um, the ancient church. And the reason that there is this impression that the ancient church was more like the Orthodox than like the Catholic church is because beginning in the 5th century, the 4th century, the Western Empire began to decline economically and Western Europe did not recover economically or politically until probably like the Renaissance, the 1200s, the 1100s. And so from that entire period, from the 5th century, 6th century, all the way till the 12th century, you have economic dominance throughout Europe by the Byzantines. And so they're kind of exerting um, their own um, right out over the rest of Europe. And um, in a lot of ways, they were beginning to usurp the legitimate authority of the papacy for their own political goals. And so if you look back at the early church from the first three centuries before the Western Empire began to fall and Western econo the Western economy and began to collapse, you'll see that um, the, the church, it's not exactly, um, let's say this, there, there's more overt um, references to the papacy and the church seemed to be more yeah, not really Latin or Eastern in the way we think of them today, but there was more overt references to the papacy. Once Byzantium began to rise in dominance, though, um, explicit references to the papacy were sort of suppressed by political pressure from the um, Byzantine emperors. Anyways, let's get back to it here. This is just one example of that, where we have um, Tsar Boris, the leader of the Bulgarian people, um, wanted to submit his nation to the Latin Rite, and then um, the Byzantine Empire invaded and forced him to submit to the to the, to the liturgical rites of Constantinople, which, you know, they weren't in schism yet in the 9th century, so this is still better than being pagan, of course, but, and there's nothing wrong with being Eastern Rite either um, in the 9th century. It wasn't heretical or, or whatnot, but it was drifting in a direction of schism. Tsar Simeon the Great declared an independent patriarchate establishing the Bulgarian Greek Church in 917 A.D., in the early 13th century, communion was established between the Bulgarian church and Rome, but tragically this was lost after the Ottoman invasion. In the 19th century, great numbers of Bulgarian Christians wavered between communion with Rome and Constantinople, trying to play these Christian centers off of each other to attain greater ecclesial independence. In the 20th century, Archbishop Angelo Roncalli, who later became Pope John XXIII, helped formally establish the Bulgarian Catholic Church. Today, there are 50,000 Bulgarian Catholics. The Greek Catholic Church of Croatia and Serbia. This particular local church consists only of the Greek Catholic Eparchy of Krzyzewski, which governs churches in Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and the Greek Catholic Eparchy of Ruski Kruster, which governs parishes in Serbia. It was formed by members of the Greek Slavic as they fled Turkish persecutions in Bosnia and Slavonia and settled in Croatia. They celebrate the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in the Old Church Slavonic language. As a result of the political reorganization of the 1990s and 2000s, several other Greek rites have recently been established out of the Greek Catholic Church of Croatia and Serbia. Today, this rite contains about 21,000 members. 
there are approximately 10 million Serbian Orthodox Christians and approximately 130,000 Croatian Orthodox Christians. It is worth noting that there are many Latin Rite Croatian Catholics um, as well, so it's not like all the Croatian and Serbs are, are Orthodox. The Macedonian Greek Catholic Church In 2001, the Macedonian Greek Catholic Church was established as an independent entity out of the former jurisdiction of the Church of Serbia and Croatia. Today, it is comprised of only one eparchy. This church celebrates the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in Macedonian. In 2017, the Macedonian Greek Catholic Church contained eight parishes. It had 16 priests and around 11,000 members. In contrast, there are about 1.3 million Macedonian Orthodox Christians. The Melkite Antiochian Greek Catholic Church. So we already talked about the West Syriac Catholic Church, which is centered in Antioch. And there is another rite of Christians, of Catholics, that are centered in Antioch, and uh, but they celebrate the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And so they're they're kind of they're considered a Greek Catholic Church, even though they're centered in Antioch. They're sometimes called the Antiochian Greek Catholic Church. So there are two different rites celebrating two different liturgies, both centered in Antioch. Actually, there's a third we'll talk about in just a second. The Melkite Catholic Church represents those Christians with origins dating back to the Church of Antioch who embraced the liturgical and spiritual traditions of Constantinople. These Christians derived their names as an insult. The Syrian root for Melkite meant royal, and non-Chalcedonian Syriac Christians accused the faithful Christians of Egypt and the Levant as being unwittingly submissive to the official council of the Byzantine emperor and basically not being free thinkers like they were. You want to be free to believe the truth, not error. And so the Melkites were... This term was a slur because they were seen as being like traitors to the Syriac people and the Syriac church and embracing Constantinople instead. In 1724, Patriarch Cyril VI Tanas accepted full communion with Rome. But those members of the Antiochian church who rejected communion with Rome formed the Antiochian Orthodox Church as a breakaway sect. So this was a second Antiochian patriarch who submitted his church to communion with Rome, even though there was a massive uh, break-off movement of those that didn't want that as a result. He did the right thing, even though I'm sure it was a huge cross for him to deal with so many of his people um, leaving the church and forming a schismatic sect. Today, Melkite Catholics reside in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel and Palestine, and also in diaspora around the world. There are 1.6 Melkite Catholics worldwide, and there are 4.3 million, uh, 1.6 million Melkite Catholics, not just 1.6 Melkite Catholics. And there are 4.3 million Antiochian Orthodox Christians worldwide as well. The Maronite Church is a rite of Christians that emerged out of the Melkite Catholic Church. The Antiochian Syriac Maronite Church is seated in Berkerke, northeast of Beirut, Lebanon. It is the most dominant Catholic rite of Lebanese Christians. This rite developed around the charismatic leadership of St. Maran. After the Council of Chalcedon, the monks who carried out his legacy, St. Maran was a monastic, vigorously defended his teachings and the teachings of the Council of Chalcedon about the hypostatic union and the two natures of Christ. Because of persecution and conflicts in the Middle East, Today, two-thirds of the world's 3.5 Maronites live outside of the Antiochian region. To this day, the Maronite Rite Church remains a strongly monastic rite. Its monasteries are an essential element of their spirituality. It is, in a sense, the monastic branch of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church. The Maronites celebrate a unique liturgy, the West Syrian or Maronite liturgy, which is centered around the Anaphora of the Twelve Apostles, which is also featured in the Liturgy of St. Chrysostom, but has other elements as well. So the Maronite Rite and the Melkite Rite are both the Catholic equivalents of the Antiochian Orthodox Rite, and um, there are 3.5 million uh, Maronites, and there are 4.3 Antiochian Orthodox. So if you're keeping score, um, that is more... Antiochian Catholics when you combine Melkite and Maronite than the Antiochian Orthodox. The Hungarian Greek Catholic Church. Ruthenians and Serbian Catholic Christians had long had a presence in Hungary due to persecution from the Turks.
During the 17th century, as Catholic Protestant wars ravaged Europe, a large number of Latin Rite Hungarian Catholics began worshipping in the Eastern Rite churches. Ultimately, these Christians began to celebrate the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in Hungarian. This unique practice persisted, leading to the establishment of a distinct local church in the year 1912 with the establishment of the Eparchy of Haj Dororog. Today, there are close to 200 Hungarian Greek Catholic churches with about 330,000 members. There is no Hungarian Orthodox Church. Notably, most Hungarian Christians are Latin Rite Catholics, not Hungarian Greek Rite Catholics. The Slavic Greek Catholic Church In 1646, the Union of Usharod sealed communion between the Pope and liturgically Byzantine churches in Slovakia. After the Soviet Union conquered these territories, the Eparchy of Mokochevo held a sort of kangaroo synod in which corrupted clerics voted to sever communion with Rome and submit the Slovakian church to the communist puppet Patriarchate of Moscow. After the fall of communism, most of these churches returned to communion with Rome although some remained in Orthodox schism. Today, there are about 200,000 Slovak Greek Catholics, and there are about 50,000 Czech Slovakian Orthodox Christians. The Romanian Catholic Church After the Habsburgs conquered Transylvania, the Metropolitan Athanasie Angel accepted full communion with the Pope by the Act of Union of 1698. A synod of Romanian bishops accepted this act of communion in 1700. Under communist rule, the Romanian Catholic bishops and priests were placed under tremendous pressure to convert to orthodoxy. Those that refused were often imprisoned or killed. These Christians celebrate the Byzantine rite of John Chrysostom in Romanian. Today there are about 500,000 Romanian Catholics and there are about 14 million Romanian Orthodox Christians. The Russian Greek Church The Russian conversion to Christianity in the 10th century was to a unified Christian church. There is no evidence that the Russian church entered into schism until its definitive rejection of the Council of Florence in the mid-15th century. Russian poet and philosopher Vladimir Sergeyevich Slavoyev, I apologize if I pronounced that wrong, called for communion with the Pope. In 1894, the Russian priest, Father Nicholas Tolstoy, made a profession of faith, entering into communion with Rome. Ukrainian Greek Catholic Metropolitan Bishop Andrei Shepetsky attempted to convert a good number of Russian prelates and old believer clergy in the late 19th century. Um, the Russian Peter the Great made some reforms to the Russian Orthodox Church during his reign, and those that refused to accept those reforms formed the, the schismatic um, sect the old believers and so there still are old believer Russian Orthodox in Russia they're kind of a distinctive church from the Russian Orthodox Church and um, the Ukrainian the Metropolitan we just talked about tried to convert both of them to establish communion with Rome after religious tolerance was granted to Russians in 1905 Russian parishes in communion with Rome began to sprout up these were organized into a Russian Greek particular church in 1929 but due to extreme persecution by the Soviet Union, only 3,200 souls of this Russian Greek church remain today. There are, in contrast, approximately 90 million Russian Orthodox Christians. The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church was also born of the Union of Brest in 1596, which established communion between the Ruthenian Church and Rome. Once again, Ruthenian shares a root with the term Rus. This Unia Church was broken up when the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was annexed by Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Those Christians of the Unia Church who were absorbed by the Austrian Empire were ethnically Ukrainian and were eventually recognized as such. Traditionally, the Ukrainian Church celebrated the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in the Old Church Slavonic, though many churches today translate the liturgy into Ukrainian, or even English. Today, there are 5.5 million Ukrainian Rite Catholics. There are about 20 million Ukrainian Orthodox Christians in contrast. The Latin Rite, also known as the Roman Rite. 
The Latin Church is the most dominant particular church in the world, not only of the Catholic Church, but of any Christian body. There are approximately 1 billion Latin Rite Catholics today. It is comprised of the liturgical and canonical traditions which are tightly regulated by the Pope and the Church of Rome. Once liturgies began to standardize after the Peace of Constantine, the Roman liturgy developed into its mature form, centered around the Roman canon. Today, Rome has deemed it prudent to institute a more simple and even perhaps flexible liturgy to reflect its nature as a global, multicultural rite. Because it's perceived that there is um, a value to allowing different cultures to express their own religious genius and their worship of God within the boundaries of orthodoxy, the Latin Rite is the most flexible rite in the world today because there are cultures all over the planet that celebrate it. That was the thinking behind instituting the Novus Ordo. And of course, you could have your, um, your concerns that the flexibility of the Latin Rite Missal provides room for heretical um, forms of worship. And we see that, unfortunately, a lot in Western civilization. But that is the thinking behind the flexibility that um, this is one rite that includes everybody from you know, like uh, Jamaicans to Americans to Mongolians to, you know, Nigerians, so to Peruvians. So there's there's a need to allow some flexibility for those different cultures um, to kind of worship in a way that allows them to express their um, unique perspective on the eternal truths. Please consider watching how the Last Supper became the traditional Latin Mass on this channel in order to learn more about the full development of the Latin Rite liturgy from the Last Supper to the present day. There are over 1 billion Latin Rite Catholics, compared to about 18 million Eastern Rite Catholics. So obviously, there are far more Latin Rite Catholics than Eastern Rite Catholics. There are approximately 3,000 Western Rite Orthodox Christians, and so that's a tiny little um, section of Orthodox that practice the traditional Latin Mass, um, but are in a state of schism, not in communion with Rome. There are a few other Western rites that are a part of the Western Church. The Ambrosian Rite is one of the rites that's celebrated in the city of Milan. Ambrose of Milan, the teacher of St. Augustine, and the Ambrosian Rite, named after him, likely dates back to the 5th century, at least to at least as uh, Pseudo-Ambrose, um, a writer of that period, referred to it in De Sacramentis. And this rite presents us with a glimpse of the church, which certainly had much in common with the Roman rite of the 4th century, although the Ambrosian rite is not necessarily a mirror image of 4th century Roman practice. So it is basically the liturgy of the city of Milan, and so it was probably very similar to the Roman rite. It is a Western rite, but it does have some distinctions. Some hypothesize that the that since Milan was the cultural center of the Western Roman Empire in the 4th century, that Rome may have actually followed the lead of Milan in its liturgical manners. So this could be kind of an ancestor to the Roman Rite, perhaps. In all essentials, the Ambrosian Rite is the traditional Latin Mass, with the exclusion of the Roman chanting style, and it has a Greek style of chanting instead. It does not have the Agonist Dei prayer, since that was added to the Roman Rite in the 7th century, and it has a different version of the Kyrie Eleison chant because a late 6th century borrowing, uh, because um, the Roman Rite borrowed, or basically established the Kyrie Eleison in uh, the TLM's form in the, late 6th, in the late 6th century. There are also certain other ceremonial differences. Uh, red cassocks are used, and six weeks after, there are six weeks of Advent, and the processional cross faced backwards rather than forwards. The Roman canon was basically identical, but it had a different list of saints and a few other unique distinctions. Both, interestingly, included the phrase, a mystery of faith in the consecration of the precious blood. Approximately 5 million Catholics in the Church of Milan exclusively celebrate the Ambrosian Liturgy, which is a distinct rite, but not a distinct particular church. It is a part of the Latin Church. The Masoretic Rite, which is also called the Hispanic Rite and was once called the Visigothic Rite, describes the rite which was once common throughout Iberia or Spain, but was once but was eventually relegated to the city of Toledo after the Reconquista. Domerius Ferrotin, OSB, considered the Masoretic Rite to be a snapshot of general Roman Rite practices of the sixth century, stating that it was essentially the Roman Rite Mass in its ceremonies and prayers with the exception of its proper prayers, readings, and hymns being all different. 
The Masoretic Rite had a tendency towards elaborate liturgy, which was not found in the ancient Roman Rite. The Eucharistic prayer varied in the Masoretic Rite. Here are some of the... Um, I don't actually have that quote. Sorry about that. Um, you can read this article um, in New Liturgical Movement, the Masoretic Rite Canon to Communion and Dismissal. That goes over those differences. That's a great website, by the way. Whereas the Roman Rite continued to develop throughout the remainder of the first millennium, the Masoretic Rite was frozen from further developments due to oppression by more invaders. Today, it is still celebrated throughout Toledo and occasionally throughout Spain. This rite is typically not permitted to be celebrated outside of Spain without special exceptions. Again, it is a distinctive rite, uh, but it, but is a rite of the Latin Church and is not a particular distinctive local church. There are various inactive rites as well. The Gallican rite described the type of liturgy which was once celebrated in uh, modern-day France amongst the Gauls who used to live there. It is a slightly adapted version um, of it was used in the British Isles in Ireland, and it was probably used um, by the evangelized Irish, who then evangelized the rest of Europe during the Viking Age, when many people were losing their faith during the Viking Age. The Gallican Rite contained some prayers which seem to have been inspired by Byzantine prayers. There was a certain preference for the elaborate, mysterious, or ceremonial in the Gallican Rite that was not found in the Roman Rite. But in reality, the Gallican Rite, some might say, can't really be described as an actual rite. It was more of a vague outline of the Mass, similar to what St. Justin Martyr described in his first apology. There was no unifying center of liturgical life in Gaul, and so the Mass varied vastly from city to city and province to province in the region of Gaul. Numerous councils were held throughout the first millennium to try to regularize the Gallican Rite, such as the Council of Vans, Agde, Vayasan, Tours, Auxerre, and the two councils of Masan. Gallican bishops were constantly writing to Rome for advice on how to settle liturgical disputes, and so in a sense, the Gallican Rite was plagued with liturgical chaos for centuries. Eventually, Charlemagne the Great would regularize worship throughout his empire by simply um, requiring all the different provinces of his empire to celebrate the Roman Rite, and this brought an end to the Gallican Rite. The Celtic Rite is also an inactive rite, it describes the liturgy celebrated by the Celtic peoples of the British Isles, Ireland, and possibly Brittany of France. They practice the sacrifice of the Mass in a very similar manner to the Gallican Rite or the Masoretic Rite. It was kind of a general structure that mirrored the Roman Rite of Rome, but had much variation in its choice of readings, its construction of prayers, its style of music, and its choice of hymns. Some attempts have been made by neo-Protestant groups, Anglicans, and Western Orthodox Christians to argue that the existence of a Celtic rite indicates the existence of a non-Roman Celtic church, but this is contradicted by the fact that Celtic bishops participated in synods such as the Council of Arles in 314 AD, which dealt with the Donatist heresy, and the Council of Rimini in 359, which was a synod in Italy, whose conclusions were ultimately rejected by the Pope for Arianist tendencies, although most of the bishops in attendance were in fact faithful Orthodox Catholic bishops, um, um, so they were attempting to come up with a conclusion. The Pope ultimately rejected it, but the fact that Celtic bishops were there um, indicates they were trying to be in communion with Rome. Celtic Rite bishops often did request the intervention of the Pope in liturgical manners, eventually leading to a gradual Romanization of the Celtic liturgies, causing the end of the Celtic Rite, and uh, today in the, all these regions, people celebrate simply the Latin Rite. The final Western rite we can talk about is the Dominican rite. And so um, the Dominican rite is the rite which is exclusively used by Dominican priests and brothers. It is licit, but it is not exactly active today as the Dominican order officially practices the Novus Ordo Mass, sacramental rites, and the Novus Ordo Liturgy of the Hours. The Dominican rite, um, some believe the Dominican rite incorporated certain lost elements of the Gallican rite. The Dominican Rite was developed mainly as an attempt to standardize Dominican mendicant forms of worship. Since the Dominicans had spread throughout all of Western Europe, um, it became very difficult for Dominicans to conform their liturgical worship to however the liturgy was celebrated in a particular city because there were variations in the late medieval period before Trent in various different cities. And so they established the Dominican Rite just so Dominican priests could celebrate one form of liturgy 
no matter what city they happen to be in. Um, some unique characteristics of the Dominican Rite include the shorter prayers at the foot of the altar, a much earlier preparation of the chalice, different hand gestures throughout the Roman canon, and during the offertory, the bread and wine are held up and offered to God simultaneously. So what about the Great Schism? Was there, in fact, actually a Great Schism in 1056 AD? That is a great story for another time. This is one of the longest videos I've ever made, so we better wrap it up. Let's get going back with the story of St. Thomas, but I will eventually make a video about the Great Schism and the Council of Florence. Um, it's important, though, just to wrap up our talk about the rites, that licit rites do exist in communion. Oh, and if you heard me say it's a long video, that's because I'm originally filming this uh, joined to a video about St. Thomas the Apostle, um, but I will be posting uh, the video about the rites all by itself. And so you could watch just, you know, the video all about the rites, but I will also post um, this video about the rites inside of a longer video about St. Thomas the Apostle. To wrap up, though, licit rites exist in communion with the Pope that embody the spiritual genius of the various Eastern traditions. And so for that reason, anyone who is attracted to Eastern spirituality has a moral duty to perhaps worship in a Eastern Rite Catholic Church in communion with Pope. Um, no one has a licit valid reason to become uh, schismatic because of their interest in Eastern spirituality. We also pray, of course, that the Great Schism may end soon and all theological and ecclesial errors be expediently resolved between the leaders. Let us pray for union between the Eastern churches who are still in schism and the Catholic Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Mary, Mother of mercy and refuge of sinners, we beseech thee to look with pitying eyes on heretical and schismatic nations. Do thou, who art the seed of wisdom, illuminate their minds wretchedly involved in the darkness of ignorance and sin, that they may know that the Holy Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman Church to be the only true Church of Jesus Christ, out of which no sanctity or salvation can be found. Finally, complete their conversion by obtaining for them the grace to believe every truth of our holy faith, and to submit to the sovereign Roman Pontiff, the Vicar of Jesus Christ on earth, that thus being soon united to us by bonds of divine charity, they may make with us but one fold under one and the same pasture, that we may thus, O glorious Virgin, all sing exultingly forever, rejoice, O Virgin Mary, alone thou hast destroyed all heresies in the whole world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This will be the end of the video about the different rites of the Church. Um, I'm going to continue now with uh, the story of St. Thomas the Apostle. So if you want to watch that whole story, just watch that whole video. So it's said that at one point, St. Bartholomew joined, um, he journeyed to India to bring St. Thomas a copy of St. Matthew's Gospel. Eventually, St. Thomas angered a group of local Hindu priests, and this led to his death. Hindu Brahmins, or priests, ended his life. He gained his victory in 72 A.D., in India. I hope this video has helped you understand the different rites of the church and how they formed, and I hope you're able to tell with confidence the story of St. Thomas. Let us conclude with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, Sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. In nomine Patri, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Well, God bless you, and I hope he keeps you safe and happy throughout this week, and may he remove from your mind anything I've said, unfaithful to him or untrue. We'll see you next time. God bless you, and bye.